The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Wailing sirens, barking dogs, and endless construction. City life can be noisy, but can the racket also be bad for you? We'll find out tonight. Then Steve talks to Ontario Liberal leadership contender and MPP Ted Shu about why he's thrown his hat in the ring. And with many people celebrating Pride this weekend, our Ontario Hubs field reporter, J.N. Jaganathan, finds out about a basketball drop-in event with rainbows courtside. Also, the Agenda's Week in Review recaps our look at nightlife mayors and Canadians living longer. It's Friday, June 23rd, and that's all ahead on the Agenda. One of the top reasons citizens contact their municipal governments is noise complaints. And it's not just about being bothered by loud sounds such as construction or traffic. Increasingly, it's also a health concern. With us to explain, in London, Ontario, Tor Oyamo, professor in the Department of Geography and Environmental Studies at Toronto Metropolitan University. And here in our studio, Ingrid Boudet, founder of No More Noise Toronto. Hi to you both. Hello, thank you. Uh, Ingrid, I noticed you've got some props for us. We're going to uh, actually talk about what it is that you have. Mm -hmm. But Tor, I wanted to start with you. Uh, can you give us an idea of how loud our cities are in this province? That's a good question. We're really just starting to get a good, good idea of that. We've done uh, some mapping citywide as well as locally, but uh, just in terms of levels, it's it's difficult to, to quantify, but what we think about uh, normally is the proportion of people that might be exposed to excessive levels. Uh, and in Toronto, for example, over 90% of people exceed nighttime noise level limits that are recommended by the WHO. Well, how would you how would you define excessive noise? Because I think um, a lot of us, you might have that one neighbor who might be mowing the lawn when you're trying to you know get ready for dinner. But how do you define excessive noise, Tor? Yeah, so this is a bit uh, disciplinary, I suppose, where 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 I work. Um, as you said, most of us can relate to noise, and we'll think about perhaps acute things like dogs barking or construction noise over a short period of time that's disturbing us. Uh, something that prevents us from sleep now and then. But I, I think about, and, and my colleagues and I, we, we work on noise that happens uh, over prolonged periods of time and then tends to then over time continue to, to cause stress levels to increase. And, and then there's a cascade of, of health effects downstream from that that we can observe. Um, Ingrid, uh, I'm going to ask you what you have here, but first I wanted to ask you uh, a question about the work that you do. You're actually mm -hmm. the founder of a group trying to cut the excessive noise in Toronto. Mm -hmm. um, why is this issue important to you? This issue, this issue is important to me because I live in the city and I'm entitled to live in the city and people are modifying their vehicles and racing on our streets, which wakes me up on a nightly basis. And so when I was starting to study noise and I saw the noise models that Tor and, and the researchers have produced, they are absolutely valid and they are good, great for decision making. But what I found was that they didn't actually um, portray what I live with at the bedroom window. And that is these noise spikes that come from these intermittent noise sources. And, um, and I decided to research it, learn a little bit more, and find out what I can do. You used an interesting word there. You said you're entitled to live in the city. Because I guess <laughs> the argument can be made that if you don't like the city noise, move somewhere else. Absolutely. Right? And, yeah. and you say no. Where do you live in the city? Um, so I live uh, close to the Gardener. So highway. And, yeah, yeah, and in a, in, a, in a dense urban area um, that also has arterial streets running through it, like Queen or King. Um, and so uh, there is both noise that comes from the highway, but also noise that comes from the arterial streets. And I also wanted to understand the difference between highway noise mm -hmm. and what most, because most people live on arterials, and what that noise level is like. Well, why is, why, what is the difference? Why is it important to know the difference? So highways can put out like a hum, and that's where the, the uh, noise modeling and the mapping will show that all, if you look at the, the highways all around Toronto, they are anywhere from 80 to 90 to 100 decibels. 
and and Tor and his team they they map that and so you can see that difference but that only shows this this high level hum but when that hum goes away so for example I had a noise meter on the side of the gardener when they closed it for the ride for brain health all of a sudden that high level went away and we could see all these individual noise spikes that people live with and so even though when you hear when everybody knows when you're sitting beside a highway you hear that hum but then you can still hear that one single engine mm -hmm. that one siren that one um, that one motorcycle racing and so it's those spikes that don't necessarily show on those models because those are averaged over time well uh, Tor Ingrid mentioned that you are studying this mm -hmm. and um, we we know that there's a housing crunch uh, not just in this province, but across yeah. the country, and a lot of people are living in denser areas. Um, how does this, these noise spikes, how do they impact us beyond just being an annoyance? How do they impact our health tour? Yeah, so the, I don't want to get into sort of the nitty gritty of noise modeling and how these spikes uh, are absorbed by the way we represent data on a large scale like a city. Uh, but they do, of course, coincide with wherever you have, in general, a lot of traffic noise, you're probably also going to have a lot of these traffic noise spikes. So the, there's definitely some some correlation there. So we're able to map out, uh, and likely those spikes are causing uh, some of those health concerns, health outcomes that we see. So um, as we most, as we're, we're familiar with individually, these things like annoyance and sleep disturbance, I think, uh, are, are well known and easy to understand. But as I uh, mentioned briefly earlier, when those things happen over a long period of time, we can have these chronic stress responses in our bodies, and over five, you know, five, ten, fifteen, twenty years, it can be different lengths of time for different people. It's not sort of a hard, hard and fast number, but we're seeing over long periods of time in longitudinal studies that these stress responses, when they're over, happening over and over and over again, uh, can lead to things like ischemic heart disease or, or just heart disease in general increased blood pressure. We're also seeing uh, more downstream outcomes on things like diabetes. Uh, stroke has also been shown to be, be uh, correlated with traffic noise too now. So there's a lot of pretty severe outcomes. And again, not really happening in the way that a lot of us think about noise as a nuisance and, and, uh, and an disturbance, but over sort of in, in, an insidious exposure over many years. Uh, Ingrid, I see you nodding because mm -hmm. I guess if you're not getting a good night's sleep, it does have these ripple effects on your health in the long run. Absolutely, it does. Um, so it was um, during COVID when the streets were kind of empty and you could hear the racing and and the um, and the car and the modified cars. Eventually, I started to have my own anxiety come up because I was like, okay, I have to get up for work at 5:30 in the morning. What if I've only fallen asleep at three? Because these guys race throughout the night, mm. and this happens throughout the night. And so that's where noise at the bedroom window. It's so important to study that, and that can only happen through citizen engagement. Um, um, because researchers can't necessarily do that. Um, and so for me, I started to really feel this stress um, and anxiety. Um, I've had, I've suffered, I've been diagnosed with depression and anxiety before. And so I managed to, you know, manage that. But this is the kind of thing that comes up that noise exasperates those kind of issues. And you were talking about people um, and people that have um, suffered from head injuries, people that have had strokes, people that already, people that are blind. Um, all of these people are affected by noise. And whatever issues people may have, this is another barrier to them properly functioning and having a healthy environment and being productive individuals. It adds additional stress. Adds additional stress. Uh, what is it that you have? Can, uh, can you explain to us? Yeah, so I've got uh, two, two things here. So this is an environmental noise meter. And um, it, so right now you can see that I'm talking at about 70, 71 decibels here. So this is what I placed outside my balcony. Uh, or on my balcony to see what the noise spikes were because I wanted to understand that. And so this records sound levels. And so it's not noise necessarily, it's sound levels. And the level of the sound level, so decibel level, is where it starts to... Um, like the pitch. Uh, yeah, and, and all of that. So that's when it starts to impact your health, when it's actually anything above 55 decibels has an impact to your health. Really, because so. we're talking at around 70, 75, mm -hmm. and it seems fine, but that actually... Yeah. yeah, and I would say that that is how we are... This is human-centered noise, but when you have combustion engines and you have 
man-made noise, so to speak, that's when things start to, like that constant hum and also the frequencies um, make a difference. So this is one of the meters. Mm -hmm. And the other one is, this is a uh, from a company made in Canada here, um, Convergence Instruments. And these are the meters that were actually used for the Toronto Public Health Study um, called How Loud is Too Loud. And so these just log the data and they run on battery for 24-7. Uh, Okay, I want to come back to you with what you do with that data, but yeah. I wanted to get an idea of how cities in Ontario compare to other jurisdictions. Mm. Uh, Tor, how does Ontario cities, how do we compare the noise level to other countries? We actually don't really have a, a lot of good data on that. So the, the European region, for example, is, is definitely at the forefront of this globally. So they have been a requirement uh, decades ago now that every city with more than 100,000 people has to every five years do detailed strategic mapping of noise, they call it, uh, and to get, get an idea of how many people and in what areas are exposed to excessive levels. And from there on then can have a you know na national or even uh, re you know, re regional understanding of, of the issue and, and how they're progressing towards reducing that. We don't have those kinds of initiatives in in, in uh, Ontario or Canada, for that matter. There's been some of that work done by myself and, and colleagues doing mapping at the citywide scale and, and getting uh, these sort of strategic noise maps in place where we can get an understanding of the issue on a, on a large scale. But in short, we don't uh, really have the requirements or uh, the funding or the support or the needs to do this at, at this large scale. But there's definitely an interest and in, we're making progress in, in getting a uh, better understanding of it. Well, uh, cities like uh, Paris and New York City are both using noise cameras to find people who make excessive noise. Tor, can you explain to us how it works? We have an image here on the screen and essentially it looks, and Tor, you can <laughs> you can uh, correct me, uh, It's it looks like a ball uh, with a bunch of attachments coming out with cameras and microphones and it's called the Medusa? Sure, yeah, so essentially it'll have a, a noise sensor that's able to target uh, and, and with some level of confidence, of course, what it's trying to measure, which might be the vehicle passing by or hopefully just the vehicle passing by and then it's able to take a picture of the license plate and, and likely send them a, a ticket in the mail. So pretty similar to a, a speed camera, but really in this case, measuring excessive noise levels. How successful has it been? Uh, it's a interesting deterrent. I think uh, in, it, it was tested in, in, in a Canadian city. Uh, they found that because it didn't really have the legal teeth at that point yet, people were actually going up and, and uh, making noise on purpose around it to see how loud they could be. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, as far as I understand, um, in, in cities where, where it's been implemented more permanently and integrated into legal framework, the, of course, they're going to be deterrents when people get a get a ticket in the mail. Um, Ingrid Tor mentioned that we don't really have the data, and you also mentioned that this is something that's being that has to be led by citizens. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there a little bit of frustration because if you're living this day to day, this is something that impacts your life 24/7? Uh, but maybe people mm -hmm. who are making the policies are not aware of how bad it is. I, I would agree with that, and that's where noise drops off very quickly. So if you have a couple buildings in the way, you have a nice leafy tree, you have a you have a tree environment, um, you don't have those issues. Um, and back to Tor's comment about the teeth, um, so the noise bylaws that we have in Toronto were up for review pre-COVID, and then the excessive vehicle noise and the small combustion engine um, bylaws were put on hold until last spring when the city basically said that they were going to revisit those. So we spoke about them um, in the summer and the city council debated them and the city had recommendations. One of them was a pilot for a noise camera um, system and then the councillors also had recommendations for that. It was supposed to be reviewed again this spring but now they've pushed it to Q4 of this year, 2023. So what that does for me is the data that I'm collecting both through the noise meters and also through an app where people can log noise complaints is so that we actually have um, a proper data set. Uh, when many people will know if they've tried to call 311 regarding a noise complaint, um, the car's already gone. 
Um, it doesn't work. They and that's where the city bylaw officers are the ones trained with the sound meters, but they need to work with the police to stop the car. So it's one of those things where it's really easy to go, oh well, we can't do this because of this, and we can't do that, and so they do this finger pointing. And the police themselves have said it is not worth our time to do blitzes against excessive vehicle uh, mod or <laughs> vehicle modifications because the teeth, the, the bylaws aren't strong enough. How does that make you feel? Uh, actually, it makes me excited, mm -hmm. um, to be honest, because that means there's a window. Mm -hmm. There's a window of time, and there's enough people that are frustrated with the process, and there's enough people that are frustrated with the situation that I'm hoping that's going to galvanize mm -hmm. um, them, and hopefully the tools that I'm providing and the services that I'm providing provide the data so that you can only make good decisions from good data. Mm -hmm. And 311, at this point, is not providing accurate data. I love that. That should be a T-shirt, you can only make good decisions with uh, good data. <laughs> <laughs> I used to work with data, so I get that. Uh, Tor, you know, we mentioned housing uh, earlier. Uh, the province's housing plan involves putting a lot of new homes on major streets, mm -hmm. especially in areas they call, quote, transit-oriented communities. Given what we know and the impact of noise on our health, is that a mistake? Not necessarily. <laughs> um, we, we have made pretty good progress over the last few decades in, in uh, guidelines and, and building codes that help in, ensure that living areas and, and bedrooms uh, and, and homes are not supposed to exceed certain levels. And if there's a possibility of that, uh, it's, it's baked into it that there has to be additional uh, noise isolation put into the building. So moving forward, I, I certainly see opportunities to improve, um, improve the, the framework, the regulation around buildings, but uh, we have the materials, we have the technology, we have the know-how to to put these things in in the same locations, and it's impossible to avoid doing that with you know the needs to densify cities in general. But um, I, the bigger problem for me is is really all the buildings that have been left behind, where there's not going to be uh, funds available or ability to to retrofit them to reduce noise exposures for residents within them. Um, but yeah, I, I think for, for many reasons we have to densify and we're going to have this mix of, of people and, and noise uh, in cities. We just need to make sure that, of course, our living living areas and particularly sleeping areas are, are protected. And, and as I mentioned, there's um, there's there's good Good frameworks on paper, uh, whether or not they're they're uh, enforced, it's like a different story, I suppose. I've got two minutes left, but um, I wanted to just have a quick follow up. Uh, I think some people might argue that there's not enough regulations when it comes to noise. Uh, so, how would you design a healthy but dense neighborhood, Tor? Hmm. Um, yeah. So, to the first part of that, I, I, what we're missing, uh, in 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 my view is really uh, a, a lawful restriction on indoor noise levels. We do not have that in Canada or Ontario. So there's there's quite a few loopholes um, where developments, you know, road road expansions are allowed to increase noise levels by a certain amount. You know, if it seems impossible to keep noise levels to the guidelines set by the province, then, you know, they can be given a pass. There's a lot of loopholes like that. So if we're just able to get to a point where we set firm uh, law, lawful requirements for indoor levels, then we get a lot farther ahead. Uh, but that aside, how, how do we design these neighborhoods? We, we know a lot. We, we can borrow a lot from uh, planning principles that are already being used, like new, new urbanism, where you know, transit and active transportation focused neighborhoods will will make a good difference or impact on reducing noise levels too. So, uh, is it likely that we're going to get rid of Cars and traffic altogether, of course not. But uh, we can certainly do a better job of, of separating these things from, from where people uh, live and work. Ingrid, I'll let you have the last word. Thank you so much. So um, when I started researching noise, I remember reading a document and they said that we cannot mitigate noise at the source. 
And I went, no, we can. So on a federal level, cars are tested to be 80 de 85 decibels. So once they once that car gets on a, on a vehicle, then the provincial laws take over. And that's where there is no maximum decibel level of vehicles. And that's wrong. Mm -hmm. So I think that we can just, if we if those laws can carry through and that we have an 85 decibel level, level maximum across the board, that would be super easy to enforce. And it's also then, at, it's, it's the federal guidelines. And back to TOR, you know, like there is just so many things legally that can be done, Environmental Protection. Protection Act. We have a right to a healthy environment. That bill was just passed. So I think that we are in a great place right now to make some significant changes so that everybody can have a better night's sleep. And maybe too, the people who are participating with these, uh, who are making the noise, maybe if they understand more on the impact of noise on their neighbors, maybe they'll change their behaviors, hopefully? Let's hope. Let's <laughs> hope. Education is a big piece, and, and thank you for this segment, because you're helping with that. We appreciate it. Tor, Ingrid, thank you so much for helping us understand this better. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Ask people watching the Ontario Liberal leadership race what they think of Ted Shu, and you basically get the same answer. Really nice guy, but can he win? It's a question Shu knows he'll need to face head on if he's going to be competitive against three better known challengers. But Shu does have one thing going for him that those other three don't have, and that is a seat in the legislature from which he could hit the ground running should he win. And with that, let's welcome the MPP for Kingston and the Islands. There's Ted Shu. Nice to have you here in the studio. Good to be here. Is this really the first time you've been in here? This is the first time I've watched wow. the show so many times. Okay, though. well, wow. <laughs> long overdue. Good to have you in that chair. Let's tackle that first question right off the top there. He's a nice guy, but he can't win. True? I'm a nice guy. <laughs> uh, I think it's, a, it's an asset in politics. And I'm determined to win this leadership race. And I've won before in, in 2011. Uh, that's when I first got elected as a federal MP. That was the worst election showing ever for the federal Liberal Party. Um, no shame to lose that election. Uh, I won my seat, and I even increased the Liberal vote, so I can win. In fact, I think history struck twice in that front, because you won when Liberals all over the country were losing. That's right. And then again, when you came back into public life in 2022, you won a seat again when Liberals all over the province were losing. What do you think that says? I win by, first of all, building a team and connecting with people. And I think I can connect with people who might lean NDP or lean Green or lean uh, Red Tory. I think it's the most important thing is to connect with people and earn their trust. And I know that I've done that in Kingston. And that's how I can win when the party is losing. So tell us more about that. What, what do you say your unique selling proposition is to Liberals who are watching this right now? I want to help Liberals win by earning the trust of people, by traveling around to, to meet people in person. I think that it's very important to meet people in person to earn their trust. I think it's important, uh, here's where the nice part comes in, to be fair and respectful when you're criticizing the other parties. Because people will believe you if you do that. Uh, and I think we should put forward some, some bold policies because people are hurting. They're worried about cost of living and the health care uh, crisis. They want to see that we're serious about these issues. And we're willing to even lose a couple of votes because we're willing to put forward the policies that we believe in. That's another way of earning trust. You won't be surprised to hear that when I talk to supporters of yours, they say having a seat in the legislature is a real asset when you want to be the leader of this party and hit the ground running. You will also not be surprised to hear that your three opponents don't think it's that big of an advantage at all and that they think they won't have any trouble getting back to Queen's Park uh, when the time calls for it. Okay, make the case. Why is it a big deal? Let me start by saying there's, there's a bit of experience that I have that none of the three other leadership candidates do, and that is I have five and a half years of experience as an MP and then an MPP as the third party in the legislature. None of them have that. And the winner of this leadership race is going to spend two and a half years as the leader of that caucus uh, in third place in the legislature. There is no budget for the leader's office because we don't have official party status. And so we, I've got to work with the caucus, the very talented caucus, bring out everybody's talents and the staff that we have at Queen's Park. And so being a member of the legislature and being able to work with caucus on a daily basis, being able to face Premier Ford and his ministers, being able to face them in the legislature in question period and in committee and being able to place motions and, and bills 
uh, and questions on the order paper. These are all things that I can do as a member of the Ontario Legislature. Okay, let's talk experience. Bonnie Crombie would say, I was an MP too once upon a time, and I've run a big city and been re-elected twice. Uh, having won the initial time out as well. Yasser Nakfi has been an Ontario cabinet minister and now he's an MP as well. Nate Erskine Smith is an MP as well. He's been an MP for eight years. So they think they've got you covered when it comes to experience. Are they not right? I've got a lot of experience, as I mentioned earlier, as a member of a caucus in the third, uh, third party in the legislature. Journalists don't come to you right away. They go to ministers, they go to the official opposition. You've got to earn your coverage. It's harder to raise money. We've got to rebuild a party. But I've also got a lot of experience outside of politics. I worked in science. I worked in business. I managed a business line. I ran a sustainable energy association. And I put that together with my experience, the right kind of experience in politics, experience in the position that I'm going to inherit when I win this leadership race, and I put that up against any of the other leadership candidates. We're going to come back to that in a bit, but I want to talk about some of the news that you made the other day when you announced your triumvirate that will be your campaign co-chairs. And one of the names there I think will be quite familiar to most Ontarians, and that's Greg Sorbera, the former finance minister of mm -hmm. Ontario. Here's what I want to know. I gather you two have never actually met You've spoken on the phone, but you haven't met. So how did you get him? Uh, you'll have to ask him the, that question, but I spoke a couple times with him on the phone, and he asked around. He went around and talked to other people who know me, and I'd invite anybody to do that. Uh, and I, I trust in what other people say about me. Uh, and I have great respect for Greg. That's why I gave him a phone call and asked for his support. And uh, I'm very, very fortunate to have his support as somebody who can offer a lot of guidance. Uh, and um, advice. He was, I mean, let's face it, he's a, he's a big name in Ontario political history. He's been president of your party. He was a cabinet minister back in the David Peterson days, never mind in the Dalton McGuinty days. Um, but all these things are a double-edged sword, you know? I mean, he was, uh, he was a big advisor to the last guy who held the leadership of your party as well, and that didn't come out too well. You worried about that? Well, Greg, um, he was around when the party needed to be rebuilt before uh, Dalton McGuinty uh, won the leadership. He's got a long history in the party, and so from my point of view, he has a lot of advice to offer. I think that you have to learn from history. Uh, Steve, you have written a lot about uh, political history in Ontario, and there's a lot to learn from your books and from studying history and, and learning from it. I hear those books are boring. I wouldn't waste my time if I were... No, anyway, let's move on here. I've read some of them. <laughs> have you really? Yes. I thought you had better things to do with your time uh, than do that. Anyways, let's look back. You were, as you pointed out, an opposition MP in Ottawa from 2011 to 2015. And here's a little bit of you in the House of Commons in your final question period. Sheldon, if you would. But this is also the silver lining of climate change. If we solve it, we will have set an enduring precedent for cooperation amongst the entire human species. Instead of obstructing the international community on climate change, why doesn't this Conservative government cooperate? And why do they not address growing inequality at home and around the world? Good question. Why did you want that to be your last question in Ottawa? You know, climate change is something that got me into politics in the first place. I started thinking about what my kids had to face. And I realized that I couldn't just take care of them, feed them, read to them, play with them. I had to do something about the problems that they're facing. And my, my daughters keep bringing me back to politics. You got two girls. I have two girls. 20 and 13? 20 and 13. And they say, Dad, we want somebody to do something. We just want somebody to do something. Uh, and. Uh, Climate change got me into politics. I wanted to repeat that theme as I left federal politics, and it's one of the important things on my mind right now. You did something unusual. You walked away after one term from a seat that you surely could have won again. Why did you do that? Well, Steve, going back to one of your books, The Dark Side, you wrote a book called The Dark Side about the toll that politics can take on personal lives if you're not careful. Uh, my wife and I decided in, in 2014 that uh, running again, even though a big part of me wanted to run again, wasn't right for our family. And we decided that kids are only young once, but the world will always need good politicians. And right now, we are facing so many crises, I would say, at the same time. Uh, and I'm ready to run. I'm ready to win, run in this leadership race and win and hopefully lead this province 
in a couple of years. Let me find out more about that journey because you, you stood down in 2015, you did something else for seven years, and then you decided you wanted to come back into public life, this time at the provincial level. Again, how come? I never really left politics. Uh, I was a campaign manager in 2018 and 2019. I worked on a municipal referendum. The mayor of Kingston asked me to co-chair his housing task force. Um, but the provincial nomination was open, and I think that every one of the critical problems that we're working on are multi-jurisdictional. They involve the federal government, the provincial government, municipal governments, indigenous governments. Uh, and there's no hard problem that the provincial government's jurisdiction doesn't address. Hmm. In those seven years when you were sort of in between elections, you mentioned some of the things that you did. What did you do to make a living, though? Well, we, I, I had savings, <laughs> so we just lived, but we, we were, uh, we got involved in a bunch of things. First of all, we had to take care of elderly relatives. Mm -hmm. uh, we also volunteered in, to run uh, robotics clubs for kids. I got involved in some startup companies as well because I wanted to understand the challenges that we have in turning all the great research and development that we do in this country into commercial success. And so I worked with startup companies, coached robotics teams and took care of elderly relatives and stayed involved uh, running election campaigns. When you decided to come back into public life at the provincial level, you actually challenged, I think if I remember this right, you challenged the former sitting member mm -hmm. for the Liberals, Sophie Koala, who had that seat before. Right. Okay, that's, that's what we call in my business kind of awkward. How did that all go? Well, we kept the nomination contest very, very civil. I think Sophie has a lot of respect in, in Kingston. Uh, and we just kept it very, very positive, the whole campaign positive, and uh, I think it worked out. Okay, because she clearly didn't expect to be challenged for a seat yeah. that she had previously held, yeah. and then in walks you, and you say, sorry, but I want it too. Well, it's an ND, it was an NDP seat at the mm -hmm. time, and the nomination was open, and a lot of people encouraged me to run. Hmm. I'd like a view, I'd like your view on where you think the Liberal Party needs to be in 2023. And you know there is a big debate happening in the party right now. You've got, for example, Nate Erskine Smith saying, well, we need to be you know, right over there on the progressive side of things and unambiguously plant our flag there. You've got Bonnie Crombie already in the race saying, uh, on the contrary, activist center is where it's at for me. Where does Ted Shu want to bring the Liberal Party? So I don't think of it that way. I think of who needs help. So when somebody is having trouble paying the rent, uh, how do we help that person? And for me, it's not an ideological question. Uh, we should be looking at who are we not serving? And for me, uh, there are many answers to, answers to that. One of them is the Liberal Party has not lost its connection with rural and small town in northern Ontario. So instead of asking, or should we move right or should we move left, we should be asking how should we be serving rural and northern Ontario and small towns? Uh, because we haven't been doing, we've lost touch with those parts of Ontario. And so I'll leave it to other people to look at the party and say, oh, is it going right or left? But let's focus on who we're not serving. Okay, let me follow up on that, because one of your, I mentioned you've got three new people who are co-chairs. One of them's the former guitarist for Tragically Hip, right? Rob Baker. Okay, that's not, that's not a bad get. And you've got Cerbera, and you've got uh, Carol Mitchell, who's a former agriculture minister in the province right. of Ontario, who used to represent, I think, Huron Bruce, Bruce Riding? that's right. Okay, so that's, that's rural Ontario. And I presume if you talk to her, she's told you the Liberal Party is absolutely nowhere in rural Ontario right now. Yes. How are you going to bring it back? Well, first of all, let's, uh, I want to say that it's not such a stretch to bring it back because you only have to go back about 15 years to Dalton McGuinty's second majority when we still had a lot of Liberal MPPs from rural and northern Ontario. That's 15 years ago, which in politics may as well be 100 years ago, <laughs> though, right? I, mean, I guess, in, but in my yeah. life, I don't, I, in human years, I don't feel it's that <laughs> long. Uh, I think it, the important thing is to, uh, to go out and talk to people. And having the advice of uh, Carol is, is very, very important. But we have to go out, we have to put out policy early. So I think in the last election, the, 
the Liberal Party strategy was to, to hold back policy and to try to make a bigger splash by holding it back. Mm -hmm. I don't think we should hold back. I think we should be listening to people right away, putting out policy early, uh, nominating candidates earlier, getting volunteers out, knocking on doors, listening to people saying, hey, we're here. I don't believe there's ever going to be some magical policy that is going to make people in rural and northern Ontario suddenly vote Liberal. You've got to put out some policy to show that we care, that we're relevant, and then you've got to spend a lot of time and a lot of legwork going out, attending events, and meeting people. Now, a very fair point, because uh, you didn't lose rural Ontario overnight. It certainly took place over a mm -hmm. course of years, and presumably getting it back will, will need to take years as well. Having said that, could you advance one idea, share one idea with us here tonight, on something you think, okay, this is consistent with my liberal values, and I think rural Ontario would go for it as well? One of the things that's going to happen, that we know is going to happen in the next uh, few years, decades even, is that I think Northern Ontario is going to develop because of the mining of critical materials for, to fight climate change, to electrify our economy. So the, everything, all the infrastructure in Northern Ontario is going to be really important. I recently, uh, as I was driving from Timmins down to North Bay, I got to drive on Highway 11, and I got to see the condition that it's in. And there's a lot of places where there's, there's no shoulder, there's no rumble strip. Mm. Uh, if the weather were bad, it's not a pleasant road to uh, drive down. But it's part of the Trans-Canada Highway, and it's going to be a crucial part of infrastructure in the north. And I think it should be treated as a crucial part of provincial infrastructure, because the mining of critical materials in the north is going to be important for the whole Ontario economy. And so I would, I would upgrade that highway to treat it like a provincial piece of infrastructure. Now, the current government of Ontario, were they here, represented at this table, would say, OK, you're putting a campaign idea in the window based on a policy that they think they are the big winners on, right? They're trying to do ring of fire, electric vehicles, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Do I infer from your position that you would endorse all of the provincial subsidies for Stellantis and for Volkswagen in southwestern Ontario, et cetera? Well, what I would endorse is things that are wins for the people of Ontario. And if the provincial government is doing something right, I'm not going to get in their way. One of the things that I think that the provincial government is doing uh, right is they're putting money into skills training. And I would put even more, because I know that the, the money, the request that went out for proposals was way oversubscribed. So I don't have a problem saying the, the government is doing such and such a thing uh, right, because I'm out, I, I, I'm not out for glory, I'm out for, for uh, I'm not out to like pound on the conservatives, I'm out to do good things for the people of Ontario. Having said that, you are vying for office in an age where politics, at least by my reading and that of many others, has never been more toxic. How do you stay the nice guy in public life when everybody around you is throwing mud? Well, I think a lot of people who talk to me, they say, like, they're frustrated with the politicians fighting each other. They want things done. And so if I go to them and say, hey, I'm going to do it differently, I'm not going to take cheap shots at Doug Ford. I'm going to criticize him. I'm going to criticize him firmly and fairly. But I'm for you. I'm out to try to get something done for you. I think people will respond. And I, you know, it's not in my nature to to do negative attacks and take cheap shots. So I don't want to change, but I really believe that politics will be uh, better off with my way of doing politics. Well, you do have one thing that I think no other politician that I've ever interviewed before has on their resume, and that is you're a PhD in physics from Princeton University. How does that help you be a better politician? Well, I, so, you have to solve a lot of hard problems in physics. You have to understand a lot of things quickly. But let me say, let me give you an answer which is maybe not expected. In science, science works because you're always checking what you're doing. You're always saying, oh, is that right? You're checking your work. And there's this sort of scientific humility that works. And it works. Science works. But it works because you're always willing to accept that you might have to change your views or maybe you did something wrong. And that humility works in science, and I want to bring that humility to politics. I think that, I think that humility of always checking, uh, asking somebody if you think, if they think you're right, if there's something, some fact that I'm missing, uh, that will be good for politics, and that's what I want to bring to politics. Uh, I hope conservatives won't misunderstand this next question that I'm going to ask, but it's pretty apparent from the results of the last two Ontario elections 
that the biggest chunk of voters wasn't looking for a PhD in physics from Princeton University. They were very happy having a guy as premier who was not a brainiac, if I can put it that way. Are you concerned you're too academically smart for the job? Sometimes uh, you can make a connection with, with a physics background or a, a science background. But there's a lot of other things in my life that I can make connections with. And I, what's important is to make connections with people. I take care of my aunt who's in long-term care. Well, I'll share that with my brother who's doing a lot of the work so I, kinda, I can do this run. Uh, we worry about our, our parents. We worry about our kids. Uh, there's a lot of things, a lot of ways. I like fishing. <laughs> I, like, I like playing softball. Uh, there's different ways that you can connect with people. And I'm not afraid of, my, afraid of my background. I think if people are worried that we have hard, complicated problems, why not have, like, it's not a disadvantage to have somebody with my background, uh, in, not only in science, but in other fields, uh, as part of the team that's trying to tackle these problems. In which case, I'm going to ask you one last question focused on your background. I gather because your thesis was focused on getting a better understanding of the large U Hubbard model and a theory for high temperature superconductors. Ted. Ted, what in blazes does any of that mean? <laughs> uh, so superconductivity, these are materials that conduct electricity without any resistance, without any energy losses. Uh, that, those materials are very difficult to work with. And uh, we're hoping that it's been several decades, but it may take a few more decades for them to be in widespread use. But there's always these technologies in the background that could make a difference. One of them in energy is, is nuclear fusion, mm. which uh, has had a lot of advances in, in the last few years. You should speak to the guys at Pickering and Bruce and Darlington about that. That might come in handy. Well, their jobs are not in danger because that is, it's decades away and we're going to need nuclear power for a while. That's Ted Shu. He's the MPP for Kingston and the Islands and vying for support at this year's Ontario Liberal Leadership Race. Ted, thanks for coming into TVO. It's a pleasure to be here. There's no scorekeeping or rules. Instead, there's silliness, fun, and belonging. Squish is Toronto's drop-in basketball night for Toronto's queer, non-binary trans community and their allies. And it's unlike any pickup basketball game you've probably seen. Have a look. Welcome to Squish. Which is Swish with Q in it. So like a queer Swish. Also, it's like squishy, so. It's a drop-in basketball night for Toronto's queer, non-binary trans community and their allies. And really, anyone who hasn't felt comfortable in a traditional basketball setting. It's non-competitive. We don't keep score. There's no rules. It's just all about like silliness and just like having the best time. You're gonna see double dribbles, you're gonna see travels, you're gonna see fouls, you're gonna see confusion. You might see somebody score on their own net, but it's, it's all part of it, there's no rules. Circle time, welcome to Swish. Players break out into teams and play three games throughout the night. Four, one, two, three. Squish got its start in 2015, and while the number of players taking part has grown, the drop-in night's mission has remained constant. I think the idea is that we are here to play collectively and so it doesn't matter what your skill set is, you're going to kind of like find a way to mesh with everyone else on your team. I played competitive sports as a kid and it's really stressful and it always gave me a lot of anxiety um, and coming to Squish I get to kind of like undo that and just have a lot of fun and still play like and still like you know get baskets and stuff but the end goal is different like the goal for me here isn't for me to get every shot in it's for me to like support my team in everyone having the best time and for everyone to be like smiling from ear to ear. I hear of people who haven't played for the last 10 years who have transitioned and you know like didn't haven't played since transitioning and can feel comfortable here can feel like they can be themselves. Queer sports leagues have been popping up across Ontario over the years. It's become an important third space for communities that have historically been on the sidelines. You have home, you have work, but you need somewhere where you can bounce your idea, just de-stress, decompress, 
grow as a person or learn things about people that are different from you, and this is the perfect third space, because I've met the, the widest variety of people here. Oh! That's that. I coming to Squish, it was by the recommendation of my friends, but I had not come out of the closet at that point. I was just perusing sports, joining groups. Oh, I'm just gonna come play basketball. But that was my way in to, to actually honestly confronting my sexuality. In fact, uh, Squish is where I kind of found a family to come out to and uh, understand myself in that context. This season, the drop-in night has been held at Central Technical School in Toronto. To cover permit costs, Squish uses a pay-what-you-can model to further reduce barriers for players. This year, however, Squish got a helping hand from Canada's lone NBA team, the Toronto Raptors. They uh, both invited Squish to Pride Night, which was amazing to go to uh, a Raptors game where everyone was like queer or like queer allied and just, you know, knowing that that's what the space was for. The Raptors support is also going to pay for Squish's entire permit for next season. And any contributions collected on top of that will be put back into the community. And it's precisely that sense of community that keeps people coming back week after week. It's been something really special about this year. New people are coming all the time, and I think that's exactly what the space was supposed to be like. That was what we envisioned, and so to see all of that come to fruition is just like so beautiful. Okay, everyone, try to squish in! The agenda this week learned why some cities are employing so-called nightlife mayors and why more Canadians are reaching the ripe old age of 100. Have a look. I grew up in New York City. I was born and raised, you know, going out mostly. I owned my own nightclub for 10 years. I served on my local community board on the liquor licensing committee for seven. And uh, actually, while I owned my nightclub, I was the number one most complained about bar in New York from one chronic caller, which really sort of activated me uh, and politicized me to not only defend myself, but really the ways in which operators were identified and treated um, as they interact with the city. Hmm. So how did you, I mean, presumably you, you uh, put yourself uh, in a position to get this gig from the city. Why did the city <clears throat> want to give you the job to begin with? Well, I mean, a lot of people wanted the job. It's an important job. A lot of people misunderstand what it might mean. Um, it's, not, it's not about going out every night, as was previously identified. It's really about being a convener and finding uh, non-enforcement and creative solutions to help resolve the issues um, that really affect the entire ecosystem of not only nightlife, but life at night. So you're dealing with owners and workers and operators, as well as residents and patrons. And I think most importantly, historically, nightlife has not necessarily been appreciated, an appreciated industry or culture or economy. It um, has been really truly criminalized, uh, overly restricted, um, uh, enforced upon. And I think now we see a global nightlife movement where even five years ago when I was appointed, um, it was really just the beginning. The first was in Amsterdam. And now there's almost 80 offices of nightlife around the world that recognize that the nighttime economy and culture are essential to our economic, cultural, and personal well-being. And the um, COVID-19 pandemic really demonstrated what a life would be like without a nightlife industry. And so these offices really are there to help reframe a historically framed industry. Uh, convene and be a liaison for the industry and all its component components to the city and uh, elected officials. Nate, why don't you pick up on that and tell us how you see the mission of the Vancouver Office for Nighttime Economy? Yeah, it's uh, almost exactly what Ariel said. It's um, 
in Vancouver, especially if uh, Ottawa is referred to as a city that fun forgot, Vancouver was called no fun city for uh, 10, 15 years. Uh, and some people still call it that. I've been saying for a long time that if you're calling Vancouver no fun city still, you're not trying very hard. Um, because it is, things have gotten a lot better here. But our sort of march toward this office started, I think, in 2017 when the then city council and mayor elected to, um, or sorry, put forth a motion to um, do a late night lockout, which would mean that after a certain point in the night, we wouldn't be allowed any new patrons into the bars and clubs in our entertainment district or anywhere else in the city, which was uh, which had devastating consequences in King's Cross, especially in Australia, if you want to use that for uh, sort of a test case of what a, you know, moronic idea that was. Anyway, um, so this led us to finding Merrick Milan, who, um, as Ariel pointed out, was the, the first nightmare ever in Amsterdam. And we flew him over twice to speak to city council, to speak to the Board of Trade, um, the Downtown Vancouver Business Improvement Association, the community, uh, and started getting this idea out that this is the way to go. So, you know, it's been a, it's been a while, and the then mayor, and now we're on the third mayor who has had this in a platform or as a priority, uh, and a lot of it, you know, I think we would already be there were it not for the pandemic, but we are just finishing up a report for city council, which will then hopefully, you know, um, catalyze the rest of of getting this office together, but it is, it's everything that Emmanuel and Ariel already spoke about. It is about advocacy. It is about building a bridge. It is about understanding the needs. It is about tourism, filling hotel rooms, and it is about culture. It, at the end of the day, um, we believe in culture through commerce, if you will. Um, it's it, the ecosystem. Nothing happens in a vacuum. Everything happens together. And I think that it's um, an idea whose time has come. In what countries are people living the longest? Well, typically uh, it is in Asian countries. Uh, Japan uh, typically leads the, the pack of uh, uh, highest longevity and also the number of centenarians. Uh, European countries are um, often uh, uh, in that group too. Uh, I think uh, with regard to life expectancy, Canada is in the top 22. So it's happening all over the world, just a little bit faster in Asian country, countries, particularly in Japan. All right. You had mentioned Japan. Uh, Japan is often described, of course, as the best place to grow old. They have a philosophy uh, that one should treasure life no matter what it looks like. What does that mean in practice? Well, it means that a lot of time and effort is put into caregiving, uh, of taking care of uh, the oldest old. Uh, people in the 80s, 90s, and certainly hundreds, uh, that no age is too old for Japan, uh, that uh, really life is treasured at every moment, from life to death, uh, how long ever it might be. All right, and you had mentioned as well European countries. I'm just curious, what are uh, European countries and Japan doing right? Well, as I indicated, caregiving is an important part. You have to invest uh, in your health. Uh, you have to invest uh, in, uh, in, in, in medical care. Um, and so there, there are basically two prongs. You have to do a lot of things yourself. Uh, European countries, uh, Japan, uh, are much more likely to be active, to be walking, when compared at least to the United States. Um, and, uh, and of course, if things do go wrong, there is uh, immediate uh, support for you. Uh, and that's much more likely to happen in European countries and in, in, and in Asian countries, certainly in Japan. All right, I should mention that the top three people, the oldest people right now are in Spain, Japan, and the U.S. And I'm coming to you, Angela, because you studied the very old in both U.S. and Canada. Briefly, what factors come into play when comparing how each country's society adds or subtracts from their ability to live to 100? Well, for us, we've been, the Canadian cohort's really new for us. So we're just starting to understand perhaps some of the unique social factors that might affect aging and aging well in Canada. But when we look at the studies that we've done to date, largely with people in the US, uh, some things that stand out to us are that these individuals typically experience less brain atrophy than do typically aging folks who are at their age, so 80 and over in our case, but whose cognitive abilities are are at age normal. So keep in mind, our elite agers, our super agers, are people 80 and over whose cognitive abilities are like those in their 40s and 50s. 
And indeed, when we look at their brains, their brains also look like people in their 40s and 50s. Uh, so there's some unique social factors as well uh, in terms of good sleep habits, hmm. uh, reading, uh, less television, uh, high social engagement. And we're finding some of the same patterns in our Canadians as well. Uh, what's unique for us here is that we have more superagers who are married to one hmm. another. And we're really trying to understand that phenomenon. In our U.S. studies, that's not the case. But over half of our cohort in Canada are actually husband and wife couples coming together for the study. Very interesting. I do want to pick up on um, sort of the differences between U.S. and mm. Canada. Uh, walk me through some of those uh, sort of s sort of social but environmental factors as well. Sure. I, I understand that uh, you know Canada, we're looking in some areas, more rural areas. Mm -hmm. uh, we're talking about possibly pollution playing mm -hmm. a factor as well. Talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, so one of the things that we're really focused on in this next study, so we've uh, had 10 years of research so far, adding our Canadian cohort 2021, 2022. So we're really just starting that piece. But we're interested in looking at how can the Canadian society uh, aging uh, group have experienced life differently from those in the U.S., particularly in terms of environmental toxins, uh, stressors, movement and mobility, as Peter mentioned, is something that's really important. One of the things that's different is on the U.S. side, most of our centers are located in urban areas yeah. and our older adults there, while having experienced an agrarian society, the U.S. industrialized at a much earlier time than we did in Canada in terms of large industrial centers. So for us, there's a real interest in thinking about how an agricultural life, a farm life, exposure to farm chemicals or lack thereof uh, in terms of Canadian regulations as opposed to U.S. regulations might affect these aging trajectories. That's just some of what we covered this week. You can find more, including the full conversations, on our website, tvo.org, our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda, or our Twitter feed, twitter.com slash the agenda. And that's all for this Friday, June 23rd, 2023. Monday, Donner Prize winning author Ryan Manucha explains why Canada may have free trade internationally, but not within our own borders. And one more thing before we go, there is a new episode of The Thread. This time we looked into the issue of bail reform and public safety. It airs this Sunday night at 7 p.m. on TVO or on any of our streaming platforms. And as always, you can preview everything we cover on our Instagram account at TVO The Thread. Hope you'll check it out. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org. Have a great weekend and see, we'll see you on Monday. The Agenda with Steve Pagan is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. is always on. To catch up on conversations from this week or any week, visit our website, tvo.org slash the agenda, or our YouTube page at youtube.com slash the agenda. It's all there for whenever you want to watch.